Despite impressive growth, by 1960, NASCAR was still a small circle of devoted drivers, mechanics, and owners, running homespun operations with little sponsorship. Junior Johnson won the 1960 Daytona 500, driving a Ray Fox Chevrolet Impala, bought right off the showroom floor and overhauled for racing in only seven days. Johnson's Chevy, sponsored by the Daytona Kennel Club, was 10 miles per hour slower than the Pontiacs. But he discovered in the middle of the race that he could boost his speed if he tailed very closely behind them. We all sat in the pits and grinned. I'll never forget. It was the biggest surprise I ever had in my life to see that little nothing car go around there like Jack the Bear. <laughs> Johnson had scored a huge upset utilizing the new technique of drafting. Just two years earlier, Johnson had been released from a federal prison after serving 11 months for moonshining. He was in his bare feet behind the mule plowing when it was called it was first race. First major race I covered was the 1958 Southern 500 and I was totally unprepared for what I saw. I didn't realize cars could go that fast, and I didn't realize that there were men crazy enough to drive them. And the craziest of all in that race was Junior Johnson. Uh, he absolutely uh, was full bore from the time the green flag fell. You're looking at a man who has so many talents and abilities in different areas. Junior brings a lot of common sense to the table. I'm not talking a lot of book education here. I'm talking about a lot of life experiences. Raised during the Great Depression on his family farm at Ingalls Hollow in the hills of Western North Carolina, Robert Johnson Jr. knew two things in life, love of family and hard work. The fourth of seven children Junior, as he came to be known, possessed a quiet confidence, natural curiosity, and strong intelligence. The Johnsons barely scratched out a living from their land, raising livestock and crops. Junior tells a story about uh, how tough a time they were having during the Depression. They had the Watkins salesman, the traveling salesman, went farm to farm, home to home, and the Watkins man had come by Junior's dad's farm. Mr. Johnson ordered some packets of seed from him for the garden. Watkins man came by some weeks later to deliver the seed, and the cost was 35 cents, and his father did not have 35 cents to pay for the seed. The elder Johnson turned to making and selling bootleg whiskey. The difference between relative prosperity and abject poverty. By 1935, Junior's father was one of the biggest moonshiners on the East Coast. Revenuers raided the family farm that year and seized over 7,000 cases of illegal whiskey. At the time, the largest moonshine bust ever made on the East Coast. Junior revered his parents for their steadfast determination to rebuild after each raid. He epitomized the commandment honor thy father and mother because uh, he still talks about them and how much they meant to him and uh, the family life they had growing up. At age eight, Junior was driving his father's pickup truck and by 14, he was delivering moonshine to small towns off Highway 421 a notorious bootleg run not far from the Johnson homestead. Getting caught was bad business, so Junior learned how to build the fastest bootleg car in town. With his regular clientele, Junior could pull in 500 bucks per night running whiskey. Junior and his partner, Gwyn Staley, were making a run to Lenore, North Carolina, when they stumbled upon an auto accident. They saw skid marks and a car had uh run off up into the woods, turned over, and steam was pouring out of it. And two men were walking around the car in a daze. Well, Junior, being the good-hearted soul that he is, stopped to see if he could help. Well, it turned out the two men were 
the high sheriff of Wilkes County and the chief deputy. They had liquor on their breasts and lipstick on their collars. And they said, uh, Junior, Lord, thank goodness you're here. Uh, you've got to help us. You've got to get us to the courthouse. If uh, they catch us in this state, we'll be thrown out of office. And Junior says, uh, hell, I can't take you to the courthouse. I got that car loaded with liquor. They talked it over uh, a bit, and Junior rearranged the load of liquor in the car, and Gwen did the same in his car, and they hauled them back to the courthouse. The sheriff and the deputy setting on cases of liquor to be taken to uh, relative safety Sure enough to his word, the sheriff never gave Junior any problem again. Plowing along the rows of corn, one hot summer day in 1949, literally in his bare feet, Junior was asked by his older brother, L.P., if he would drive his liquor car in a race at the new Wilkesboro Speedway, a country dirt track recently built down the road from the Johnson family farm. Junior jumped at the chance, finishing in second place, and was instantly hailed as the Wilkes County Wild Man for his fearless driving. Johnson was soon drafted into Big Bill Francis NASCAR. In his first year, he won five races. But a year later, 1956, he was ambushed at his father's whiskey still by the revenuers who charged him with manufacturing illegal spirits. It was the only time Johnson was found guilty of bootlegging. At age 24, he was sent to the Chillicothe Federal Prison for two years, but was released after 11 months for good behavior. Johnson rejoined the red-hot NASCAR circuit and resumed one of the most legendary careers in sports. He was everything, you know, he, he was a great driver. He was like a Curtis Turner. Junior, Junior Johnson, Curtis Turner, the two toughest. And Junior could do it all. When he retired as a driver in 1966, at the young age of 35, Johnson had amassed 50 victories in NASCAR, but he was not satisfied. He wanted his own team. With funding from his Wilkes County neighbor, Holly Farms Chicken, Junior began to build his own empire. Johnson was the common man's Leonardo da Vinci. Like the great Italian master, the brilliant Johnson was an architect of invention when it came to sculpting race cars. I heard a young reporter ask Junior one time, uh, very arrogantly, uh, Junior, do the engineers from General Motors ever come down and help you out? He said, no, they come down and I help them out. Junior shows what racing started out as, what it became, because he was racing when the sport was in its infancy. And then he made the transition to team owner and then made the transition to one of those teams that corporate America wanted. As a team owner, Johnson won six Winston Cup titles, three in a row in the mid-1970s, a NASCAR record. In 1985, Johnson received a pardon from President Ronald Reagan for his bootleg conviction. The beloved but modest Johnson put much more into racing than he ever took out. Without Junior Johnson, I don't think I could have made it because Junior Johnson said, go to my truck, take anything you want, and that's what we did. There are people in racing now today that are multi-millionaires that would not have been in racing to realize this wealth if it hadn't been for the generosity of Junior Johnson. He gave them parts. He shared his knowledge with them. You could fill several race car fields with people that Junior Johnson helped along the way. The 1960s decade in NASCAR ushered in even more turmoil than the formative years of the 50s. Superstar Curtis Turner, co-founder of the financially plagued Charlotte Motor Speedway, attempted to organize his fellow drivers into the Teamsters Union so he could borrow money from the group to help pay for his track. 
turn Iran into fierce opposition from Bill France, who declared he would never allow Union activity in NASCAR and would use a pistol to enforce it. France banned Turner, who vowed a showdown with the NASCAR founder at the upcoming race at the Asheville-Weaverville track in 1961. Turner never showed up, but the frenzied, intoxicated crowd anticipating the face-off rioted when the race was suspended due to poor track conditions. 4,000 fans demanding their money back cornered winner Junior Johnson and kept him from leaving the infield. It's just mayhem. Bill France and the other NASCAR officials had taken off their NASCAR shirts and had slipped out before the end of the race, so they weren't around. The crowd only dispersed after Pop Ergel, a crewman from Bud Moore's team, hit the mob's ringleader over the head with a two-by-four. Dave Pearson's through after less than 50 laps. The shy David Pearson, who had caught his first glimpse of racing while perched in Graham Patch's oak tree, was now a local hero in Greenville, South Carolina, and quite satisfied competing in the lower sportsman division of racing. But his fans thought he was wasting his time in the minor leagues. They pitched in to help him buy a race car suitable for the Grand National Division. In 1961, Pearson became an instant star when he joined forces with ace mechanic Ray Fox, and the pair won three super speedway races in a Pontiac. The automaker's supremacy continued into the 1962 season with an amazing stretch by star Fireball Roberts, who dominated at Daytona, winning two preliminary races, the pole position and the 500 in a secretly supercharged Smoky Eunuch Pontiac. In each of those wins, Roberts set new NASCAR speed records. In 1962, five teams in the Grand National Division benefited the most when the factories formally announced their return to stock car racing. These five pillars formed the core of NASCAR, supplying Bill France with exciting weekly competition. In the early 60s and through the 70s, you had, you know, three or four teams. You had the Petty Team, you had uh, the Woods Boys, uh, you had Bud Moore, and you had Junior Johnson, and from time to time you had a Holman Moody in and out. So those were the best teams, had the best drivers, and, and won all the races, or 80% of them. Bud Moore, who had reached the top of the NASCAR summit, personified the character of the factory-backed army. The team owner captured the NASCAR championship with tenacious driver Joe Weatherly in 1962 and 63. He came home and liked fast automobiles as a lot of those young men that came back from World War II had a bit of wildness in him. And he channeled it into making a very, very successful race team. If you let crustiness offend you, then you probably won't get along with Bud Moore. But just as crusty as Bud is, Bud has a wonderful heart. And like the old racers, if he respects you, he will do anything for you. Though the factory teams were winning most of the races and grabbing most of the headlines, it was the independent drivers who were building the backbone of the sport. The superstars had to be passing someone on the track. These pugnacious characters gave NASCAR its true charm. With lots of guts and little glory, self-financed drivers struggled constantly to compete with the best teams. Hard luck driver Larry Frank was grateful to land a ride from independent owner Radis Walters for the 1962 Darlington Southern 500. The scrappy ex-US Marines Ford was humbly sponsored by a local restaurant. We couldn't run with a factory car and we knew it. And we used to joke about our division. Every race I ever went to in my life, in all the years, the closer I got to the racetrack, I couldn't help it the faster I drove. There's times probably I thought, I ain't gonna do this anymore. 
That'd be right after a race where I really felt like I should have won it. And I didn't want to feel like a loser. But then the next morning, I'd be working twice as hard to come back and see if I couldn't run a little bit stronger. With the automakers back in NASCAR and pumping out publicity around the event, the stock car racing community was a buzz for the Southern 500, NASCAR's ultimate prize. A Radis Walters car had never led a single lap in a NASCAR event. But the 32-year-old Frank, who'd been driving well all year, dared to dream he might actually run up front with the ferocious factory teams. The night before Darlington on a Sunday night, I said, my car is capable. They put down the old bear grease, the sealer on the racetrack, and, and I told people, if I can stay out of trouble and don't get too anxious, and don't let the old lady get me until it, until it wears through the bear grease, then I'll go to racing. Frank's biggest concern before the race was the execution of his pit crew, which had performed poorly throughout the year. But when they dropped the green flag, Frank jumped out in first place, and miraculously, he stayed there. It was the hardest thing in the world, the first 100 mile, but nobody passed me. And I kept worrying about a pit stop. A couple laps before pit stop, got a caution flag. Run a couple laps under caution, came in, took gas, nothing else, went right back out. I said, oh, man, <laughs> everything, maybe things are going to be all right. Hot on Frank's bumper was a sensational Junior Johnson, an intimidating presence on the track. But Johnson suddenly hit the wall, sending out the caution flag. Ray Fox. Johnson's crew chief furiously tried to repair the damage. Still in first place, Frank would pit one last time for fuel, but he was nervous about losing his front runner position to Marvin Panch, who had been making up ground on Frank all afternoon in his well-equipped Wood Brothers Ford. Frank also knew Panch had the best pit crew in the business. Me and Panch pitted under the caution together now. Him right in front of me, me right on his back bumper and I beat him out of the pits. <laughs> For me to beat him out of the pits was, it was it, well, it's unbelievable. Running strong, Frank stayed in the lead and sprinted to the finish line in first place, scoring one of the greatest upsets in NASCAR history. Ironically, right after Frank took the checkered flag, his tire blew out. I got off down in the infield in the grass, and I just parked it, and I got out of the car and just sat down beside it. I kept looking at the scoreboard, but they had lost me a lap. The big scoreboard in the center of the infield didn't have me in the top five. Despite suffering from dehydration and eye blisters caused by the sweltering 140-degree heat blowing through a broken vent inside his car, Frank knew he had crossed the finish line first, but NASCAR officials mistakenly had Junior Johnson in first place. Johnson's crew goes wild. Johnson had returned to mount a serious charge after hitting the wall, but he had never passed Frank. Junior rode into victory lane and celebrated. Lee Petty, who had directed a two-car effort from the pits, filed a protest. The crowd, who knew Frank had won, became restless while waiting for NASCAR officials to recheck the scoring cards. In shock and disbelief, Frank returned to his motel with the outcome still undecided. After five agonizing hours, he was finally declared the winner of the race. The victory was his first Grand National win. Like the mythical David, Frank had prevailed against impossible odds and slain the Goliath factories. We didn't have any pictures with Larry with the trophy. So uh, what I wound up doing on it was to take one of the pictures of, of Junior and a picture that I had of Larry and make them, print them about the same size and cut Larry's head out and paste it on top of Junior's head with, with uh, trophy. <laughs> so we had a picture of Larry Frank with the, holding the trophy. <laughs> and, they, and he used that to send out to the paper. For the award ceremony, Frank used the first place prize money to buy a pair of dress shoes. I didn't miss the trophies and the girls, but I'd love to stood up in front of the fans. I had a lot of good fans, and the people had been awful good to me, and so many people really wanted me to win as bad as I did. 
Impressed with Frank's Darlington win, Holman and Moody provided him with a shiny new red Ford for the 1963 Daytona 500. An unlucky pit stop during the race cost Frank a top 10 finish and his manufacturer's support for the rest of the season. In an act of spirited defiance and mockery, Frank later built his own Ford, painting the car Lido Lavender, the signature brand color of Ford rival General Motors. In a 10-year career with 102 starts, the 1962 Southern 500 win would be Frank's lone NASCAR victory. Every once in a while, a Darlington will bounce up. The racing gods will smile on you and everything will go right. And you stay out of trouble and you drive the wheels off of it. And then you get to get in victory lane. Now, maybe you don't get to get in victory lane. <laughs> no independent driver had it tougher than Wendell Scott the first African-American to compete in NASCAR full-time. Scott was not related to Charlie Scott, who had driven on the beach for Carl Kiefer in 1956. In Scott's rookie season of 1961, he recorded five top 10 finishes in 23 races. But the prestigious title of Rookie of the Year was awarded to Woody Wilson, who had recorded only one top 10 finish in just five starts. The snub devastated the Danville, Virginia driver who quietly vowed to continue his career despite the injustice. Traveling to races each week at the height of the racial tension during the turbulent 60s, Scott stoically confronted the cruel discrimination of the Jim Crow South. Think what he put up with in the 60s how tough it was for everyone else, but for him, they raised the bar even higher because he is a black man in a white man's sport. And he's going to primarily small towns in the South and doing this. I mean, how much tougher can you make it for someone? If you're gonna say, pick the toughest thing on earth you can do, that would be it for Wendell Scott. In one of the greatest upsets in racing history, Scott won the 1963 Jacksonville 200. Like Frank's win at Darlington, Scott's victory was marred by a scoring dispute. He was denied the winner's circle. Out of fear, his appearance would touch off a race riot. Finally, weeks later, he was awarded a trophy. Scott remains the only man of color to win a NASCAR Grand National race. Like many other struggling and deserving independents, Wendell never received factory sponsorship. Wendell, Scott, and I were the last two guys to leave the racetrack because all these factory teams used to leave a whole bunch of stuff out there, you know, and it was still good. So we used to confiscate all that stuff. You know, we weren't stealing it. It was just left there, so we take it and we use it. And, th and that's what kept us going. A guy like Tom Pistone, there were very few times when he had the best car on the racetrack. And he knew that coming in. If he'd, wa if he'd only raced when he had the best car, he would have never left the small tracks of the, of, the, of the Midwest. But I'll guarantee you there wasn't a single time that he didn't do everything he could. If he, if he was gonna finish 13th, the only thing he wanted to do in, the, in this world was to get to 12th. Dwayne Tiny Lund was another journeyman driver always looking for a grand national ride. In February 1963, Lund went to Daytona, just looking to land a job on a pit crew. 10 days before the big 500 mile race, Lund watched from the sidelines as Wood Brothers driver Marvin Panch crashed while testing a Maserati. Lund and others rushed to the scene and pulled a critically wounded driver from the fiery wreckage. From his hospital bed, Panch asked owner Glenn Wood if Lund could replace him for the upcoming Daytona 500. In an emotional story that captured NASCAR's heart, Lund actually won the Daytona 500 for his first Grand National victory. Months later, Lund received the Carnegie Medal of Honor for his heroism. Tragically, Lund lost his life 
while racing at Talladega, Alabama in 1975. Budmore Engineering was on its way to become the fourth winningest team in NASCAR history when it won four straight races in a row during the 1964 season with driver Billy Wade. That same year at the Daytona 500, Richard Petty clobbered the field in his new Chrysler with its monster 426 Hemi engine. Petty went 20 miles per hour faster than he had the previous year. Other manufacturers, desperate to match the horsepower of the Hemi, pushed the creative technological edge to beat Chrysler. The relentless drive for higher speeds had an unintended and tragic result. In a 13-month span beginning in 1964, the deaths of four drivers rocked the NASCAR community to its very core. The beloved clown prince of racing, Joe Weatherly, died instantly when he lost his brakes and hit the wall at Riverside. Weatherly's car owner, Bud Moore, was overcome with grief. It was just hard on all of us. I know that uh, I come out near quit racing myself. I told my wife when we come back from California, I said, I think I'm going to quit. I'm not going through it. So she says, well, you got to sit down and figure it wasn't all your fault. He said, just remember them brakes y'all never had run on the racetrack and Ford Motor Company had you to take the car out there and put that type of brake on there. And so you got to figure they was at blame as much as you were. We'll let it go and I kept on racing. Five months later, icon Fireball Roberts was critically injured after being engulfed in flames during a crash at Charlotte. Ned Jarrett ran to help Roberts, who had managed to free himself from the wreckage, but the driver was severely burned. After weeks in the hospital, it looked as if Fireball might recover. But he took a sudden turn for the worse and died. Critics, including the original hard charger, Junior Johnson, argued speeds were too dangerous for the tracks and tires. Shortly after Fireball's death, Billy Wade, and Jimmy Pardue were also killed while testing tires at Daytona. In a fateful irony, the tests were designed to improve safety. The factories, enticed by the rewards of participating in NASCAR, were now funding no less than 17 teams by the mid-1960s. France found himself in a difficult catch-22 situation. Manufacturers' mission in NASCAR was to win as many races as they could in order to sell cars to the public. But France's mandate was to sell tickets by producing an affordable, competitive, and entertaining show for the fans. France infuriated Chrysler by banning its massive Hemi engine in 1965. The automaker retaliated by boycotting the season. Ford then sat out the following year in a dispute with the NASCAR founder over its new overhead cam engine. The giant automaker was shocked in 1966 when independent Elmo Langley steered his self-made Ford to victories at Spartanburg and Manassas, Virginia. Also, Tiger Tom Pistone rigged together an old Ford that made several strong showings throughout the year including a near win at Martinsville, Virginia. We led the race for a long time until my brakes went out. And it more or less uh, embarrassed Ford. And Paul Goldschmidt and a bunch of other drivers, you know, said that, you know, it's a dirty shame that here's Pistone with a two-year-old car, you know, out running us. Lee Petty formally retired in 1964, the same year Richard won the first of his seven NASCAR championships. Richard surpassed his father's record for total number of NASCAR wins in 1967. That year, he drove his Chrysler to the most successful season in NASCAR history, winning an astounding 27 out of 46 races with 10 wins in a row. He was dubbed the king by the media for his supreme rule over racing. Richard Petty would retire in 1992 with 200 victories 
twice as many as his closest competitor. And Richard worked diligently. He ran every doggone track in the country. It didn't matter whether it was paved or dirt or long or short. He raced three and four nights a week. Richard Petty, who was a wonderful, wonderful person, determined very early in his racing career that the most important element in the sport were the fans. He determined that without the fans, he and the rest of the sport was nothing. I have seen Richard. He'll walk from, say, point A to the garage, and he'll have 100 people standing around him. And, and he walks, and everybody walks with him, and they hand him pens, and he'll sign. Anybody who wants an autograph from Richard will get one. Even if he's standing there three and a half hours, he will sign autographs. In part, Richard Petty's command of racing in 1967 prompted a furious attack by his opponents to beat him. The factory troubles of 1965 and 1966 were a thing of the past. Chrysler and Ford were in a war for supremacy in NASCAR, as the stakes were at an all-time high. In this era, reworking stock cars to make them go faster was not as much a science as it was an exercise of individual experimentation and plain old bravado. Well, one time or another, just about everybody's cheated and just about everybody's been caught cheating. The big thing that goes through a crew chief's mind or a car owner's mind is they look at the rule book and they say, well, it says I can do this, but it doesn't say I can't do that. With only one winner per contest in auto racing, competitors will do anything they can to earn a victory. With the inspectors they had, they, they'd done a good job, but uh, when you had so many things wrong, <laughs> and they tell you go fix this and go fix that. Well, you go fix one or two things, you know. First thing you know, they, they let you slide, you know, because you had so doggone many things that need to be fixed. Let's say uh, the petties were running a little faster than we were and this and that. And I'd have a tendency to walk over and have start a conversation with them, you know. And all the time I was doing over where I was looking. Big Bill's philosophy, first and foremost, was put on a good show. And putting on a good show requires having close competition. And the way you have close competition is if somebody's too dominant, you crack down on them and reel them back in. Compared with today, NASCAR teams in the 1960s underwent much simpler inspections as Bill France allowed car builders more freedom to alter their cars beyond the rule book. The sport within the sport flourished in NASCAR during this progressive decade. As the cars became less stock and more pure race car, teams were eager to modify them. The three main areas of opportunity for bending the rules were in weight, fuel, and aerodynamics. The guys was uh, using lead pellets, you know, and they put them in the car in different places, you know, and have a trap door. And, and when the race is over, you walk around the racetrack, and here's all these lead pellets laying all around every which way, you know, and they wonder where it came from, you know. But, I mean, uh, if you didn't cheat, you didn't win. David Pearson used to use a helmet that was made of lead when the car rolled through inspection to go on the weight scales. The helmets hang up in the cars, and they're weighed with the car. He had a helmet made of lead, so it weighed somewhere between 50 and 100 pounds. Now, obviously, he wouldn't race with, with that helmet on. He'd put a regular helmet on, but again, that was a way to get a car through inspection lighter than it should be. Aerodynamics had played no role in racing when events were held on short dirt tracks, but all that changed on the super speedways. To win at those tracks, teams discovered that lowering the nose on the front of the car and raising the car's rear deck were critical in reducing drag, gaining speed, and increasing fuel mileage. Those qualities and much more were in the Ford Galaxy Junior Johnson built for Fred Lorenzen to drive at Atlanta in 1966. The car, nicknamed by Junior's competitors the Yellow Banana, was the most visibly illegal car in NASCAR history. 
Everything about the car was blatantly wrong. The car was, the roof line was chopped, the nose was drooped over the front end, the rear was swept upward to provide additional downforce. The roof was cut so much on that car that Fred Lorenz and the driver had to be picked up under his armpits and slid in feet first through the car because the window opening was so small he couldn't get in any other way. Everybody knew the car was illegal, but France let the car run that weekend and that weekend only. It was the only race it ever, ever showed up in because he wanted to get the Fords back. He can build a race car. Junior can build any astronaut ship. And that was a mean machine. It was something that Junior Johnson only could build. Junior's biggest challenger for supremacy in the imaginative engineering department was, of course, the one and only Smokey Eunuch who regarded cheating as an inalienable right. They were inspecting one of Smokey's cars at Daytona one time, and, and I had a fuel cell out of it, and Smokey got mad about something and drove the car off, which basically had an extra gas tank in it. He said later he could have driven the thing to Jacksonville if he wanted to. Everybody was, was doing the same thing, and uh, you know, France knew that uh, some of us were doing a little more than the others, but uh, the point is, you know, is uh, was putting on a good show. If Big Bill France had booted out everyone for cheating, his operation would never have left the beach. The slogan of every team was, it ain't cheating unless you get caught. NASCAR allowed teams to flout the rules as long as they weren't barefaced about their clever handiwork. Publicly, teams stuck to a time-honored code of silence when it came to disclosing their knack for rule breaking. If you got the competitive edge on someone, why would you want to run your mouth about it? Just go out and beat them on the track. It was a lot more satisfying. And that, I think, is one thing that made the sport so intriguing in the 60s that has been lost currently is the fact that NASCAR has removed the ingenuity the innovativeness, the creativity from it that made it so interesting. Speeds prime to a fantastic 166 miles an hour. Businessman John Holman and driver mechanic Ralph Moody purchased all of the Ford racing equipment at the bargain price of $12,000 when the automaker publicly left racing in 1957. Holman and Moody then set up shop in Charlotte, North Carolina, experiencing modest success as a race team, but they survived primarily by selling parts and equipment to Ford race teams. When Ford officially returned to NASCAR in 1962, the huge automaker rewarded Holman and Moody for their loyalty by naming them their official racing contractor. John Holman and Ralph Moody were on 180 degrees different in that Holman was a businessman and understood the importance of keeping good records and books and making sales. Ralph Moody wanted nothing to do with that. All Ralph was wanted, wanted to do was build the fastest race car he could, and he knew that if he teamed up with John Holman, Holman could find the money to make that possible. The high standards set by the dynamic duo in combination with unlimited Ford funding and research produced several competitive Ford satellite teams throughout the decade. At one time, Holman and Moody had enough power from the racing end of it that we could go into a Ford factory and shut them down and say, OK, guys, the next 10 Falcons or the next 10 Galaxies have to be white with no heaters, with no radios, with no undercoating spray on them, which, of course, threw the production lines just in a in a turmoil, but racing was a high priority. The Holman and Moody was the Walmart of racing at the time. Leonard Wood told me that they'd go down almost with a shopping cart from Stewart, Virginia down to Charlotte. And if they needed rags or paper towels or Windex or carburetors or exhaust headers or tires or wheels or a chassis or a body, they could get all that from Holman and Moody and it would all be billed back to Ford Motor Company. They used to have a sticker on race cars, on their race cars that said, CP by Holman and Moody. Competition proven by Holman and Moody. Out of the Southeast, that sticker was one of the most impressive pieces you could have on a race car. It was Holman and Moody, and that was when Charlotte became known as the stock car racing capital of the world. I would rank them number one. They went from nobody to somebody 
in a matter of months, and they were spectacular. Top car builders of the South. Magnetic star Fred Lorenzen drove for Holman and Moody, winning six times in 1963 and becoming the first driver to tally over $100,000 in earnings in a single season. In one stretch, Lorenzen had one of the most productive runs in stock car racing history, winning five races in a row. A dream come true. He, see, a driver has to have their team, you know, the teamwork, good mechanics, good engine builders. Holman Moody had it all. The first among equals policy of Holman and Moody left an impressive and enduring legacy by standardizing safety throughout racing and laying the foundation for NASCAR's future success. When you start running Daytona on these bigger racetracks, the wheels could not stand the pressure that was applied to them when you went down in the corner and turned that tire, and there's so much pressure, it would break the wheel. So Holman and Moody took two centers and welded them together. So they came up with a wheel that would stand Daytona, Darlington, racetracks like that. They went fast, but they also wanted to have safe cars. Other teams wanted to go fast and win races, and they saw the bigger picture. They saw a business angle, and that angle was, let's build the safest race cars we can and preserve our heroes. They were the ones that petitioned NASCAR to come up with better onboard fire systems, um, inner liners for the tires, the roll cage that they developed from a stock ch chassis was the, the first major development that every other team quickly adapted to, and the same structure is used today, 40 years later. In 1968, duels between David Pearson's aerodynamically superior Holman and Moody Ford and the brute power of Richard Petty's Chrysler initiated one of the sport's most exciting rivalries. Pearson won back-to-back -back championships in the Ford, the only two years the Holman and Moody team ever seriously chased the title. Joining the Speedway spectacle in the late 1960s were factory drivers Bobby Allison, Cale Yarborough, Bobby Hamilton, and Bobby Isaac. Several independents driving Fords that were patched together with used Holman and Moody parts finished high up in the year-end point standing. Original characters like Smokey Eunuch continued to operate outside the boundaries set by the authoritarian France. Eunuch's legend was built upon his enthusiasm and willingness to challenge NASCAR. But as the racing series continued to grow, crackdowns on him became more common. Smokey retired from racing in 1970 when the sport got too big, too commercial. Smokey told me that the kind of racing I know, uh, I'll go home and build a car, and you go home and you build a car, and I'll meet you at the track, and we'll race. And that's really what he wanted to do. The idea that you had a, you know, a 30-man crew, that just did not appeal to him anymore. And when it stopped being fun, he got out. Though NASCAR was undergoing spectacular changes, some things just stayed the same. In September of 1967, weeks before a NASCAR race at the Middle Georgia Raceway near Macon, federal authorities discovered an elaborately concealed moonshine still hidden beneath a fake ticket booth. Jimmy Mosteller was the race announcer the day the authorities raided the track. This gentleman comes up in the tower with me and he says, would you please announce this is a final race until further advertised? And I asked him who he was and he all he had to do was show me that badge. And then I found out that they had a liquor still under the number three and four turn. Yeah, that was a well-equipped moonshine still underneath the racetrack. The sheriff said this is one of the most well-operated moonshine stills he's ever seen. He's seen a bunch of them in his days. Despite the scandal, the Macon race went on as scheduled. Lamar Brown, the track's owner, was charged with possession of an apparatus for the distillation of illegal whiskey. In a trial, 13 months later, Brown was acquitted. In 
It is doubtful the pious Wood Brothers of Stuart, Virginia, ever ran moonshine like many of their pioneering colleagues in NASCAR. Glenn was a successful short track driver who hung up his goggles in 1963 to attend to the family racing business full time. His younger brother Leonard, a shy, mechanical whiz kid, invented specialized parts and engines for the operation. In 1965, the Wood Brothers shared their lightning fast pit crew with Jim Clark's Lotus Ford team during the Indianapolis 500. With that experience, the Wood Brothers picked up exclusive knowledge that helped them reach the pinnacle of the NASCAR series. When they got there, they found out that Cullen Chapman, who was this incredibly intelligent designer, had discovered stagger. And stagger is the difference in circumference of one wheel on the same axle as another. They kept that quiet and they brought it back and put it in that number 21. And that's when David Pearson started dominating the sport. And the Wood Brothers had stagger as their private secret for more than a season before it leaked out. Now, of course, stagger is everything. They was the smartest people in racing. We changed tires, we would change the air pressure, we'd change the size of tires, and we'd change the stagger and stuff like that all the time. And nobody never knew what we was doing. With Holman and Moody now building their engines, the Wood Brothers Fords dominated the super speedway events, especially with David Pearson in the early 1970s. A pit stop that took one minute to fuel the cars, they figured out how to do it in about 25 seconds. So imagine the advantage that they had on the competition when everyone else, and they got to stop four or five times, five or six times to fuel the car. Imagine how much of an advantage they had when they spent half the time in the pits of the competition. The family, which still maintains a multi-car operation today, claims the longest operating team in NASCAR history, with over 1,000 starts to their credit. The formula behind their longevity can in large part be attributed to their close family relationships. Even today, if you go to Stewart, Virginia, you drive down one street, and the first house belongs to Glenn and Bernice Wood. The second house is to their daughter and son-in-law. And the third house belongs to their son. They're all within walking distance. And them are some of the finest people. People like that made NASCAR what it is today. They were, they're just special people. To counter Ford's superiority in late 1969, Chrysler was set to introduce its needle-nosed, high-wing wonder, the Dodge Charger Daytona, which would make its debut in September at Bill France's latest marvel, the Alabama International Motor Speedway. The Talladega track was now the fastest track in the world, longer, wider, and steeper than its sister track in Daytona. Drivers were concerned the existing tires would break up on the incredibly fast track. They were also angry over rising expenses, inadequate facilities, and the lack of prize money. During race week, the top NASCAR drivers, who had formed a union, the Professional Drivers Association, led by Richard Petty, asked France to delay the first big race at Talladega so Firestone and Goodyear could develop safer tires. The 62-year-old France flatly refused, even taking a practice lap himself going over 175 miles per hour. 24 hours before the race, most, if not all, of the top Grand National drivers pulled out of the event. France retaliated by loading the field with drivers from his Grand Touring Division. He thought the organization was a threat to NASCAR. And he despised threats to his organization worse than anything I've, I had ever seen. I mean, he just wouldn't tolerate it. And so he didn't believe that, that the tires were the problem. He thought they just wanted to boycott to show their power. The race, which had several mandated cautions, was run without a crash or a spin. It was a good thing at that. It, it didn't come out like what we had really wanted to come out. But in the long run, I think it woke them up and us up that we, we've got to improve our, our product. 
And in the long run, I think it was a, it wound up being a plus. As he had done with Curtis Turner in 1961, France fiercely resisted efforts to organize a union in his sport. But the powerful NASCAR founder was less successful at limiting the influence of the automakers. Chrysler upped the ante in the Arrow Wars by delivering the Plymouth Superbird to Richard Petty for the 1970 season. The Superbird's wing and front spoiler added downforce which improved handling in the corners and radically increased speeds. The Superbird was probably the best handling car I ever drove because uh, it had the, the nose deal on it and had the wing on the back and you just adjust that instead of adjusting the springs and stuff, you just adjust the wing deals. So like to do on Indy cars and stuff now. And uh, the car just, it drove super. I mean, it was just, uh, it was a pleasure to drive the car. Pete Hamilton in a Petty Enterprises Superbird won the 1970 Daytona 500, averaging over 149 miles per hour. 10 of the first 13 finishers in the 500 were steering wing cars. In March, Buddy Baker broke the mythical 200 miles per hour mark on a closed course in a Dodge Daytona at Talladega. The feat could not have been imagined just 10 years earlier. Drivers were still worried about speeds as new super fast tracks had been built in Delaware and Michigan. NASCAR corralled the wing cars and speed by mandating carburetor restrictor plates, which drastically reduced engine power. The new edict applied to all cars in every race, not just on the super speedways. After a lifespan of just 18 months, NASCAR finally outlawed the special edition wing cars. But the legendary cars will live forever in the minds of race fans as the most exotic and intriguing stock cars in history. When that car got better, everybody else got better too. But it was, I, th I think in, in those uh, 59, 69 and, and 70 was probably as good a, a driving race cars as, uh, as, as they've been. And I don't think they've ever got back to that, uh, that era again. It was the uh, glory of the muscle car eras. And they were magnificent creatures. They're, they're, they're ahead of today's time. Can you imagine those things going today with the tires today, with no restrictor plates? They could go 240 mile an hour at Talladega, I don't have any doubt. The 1970 championship was captured by the quiet loner, Bobby Isaac, who had clawed his way out of desperate childhood poverty to grasp the highest rung in NASCAR. Isaac was the classic American success story. At age 12, he'd gone to work at a North Carolina sawmill, where he earned enough money to buy his very first pair of shoes. Isaac's inspiring story was the bright spot to an otherwise difficult start for NASCAR in the 1970s. In the fall of 1970, Richard Petty won the very last Grand National race on dirt at a half-mile track in Raleigh. The race had signified the beginning of the end of the golden era of NASCAR. The factories again pulled out of the racing series in 1971, protesting what they claimed was France's vice-like grip on innovation. With no financial support, former factory drivers and independents alike struggled to make ends meet. Live television emerged and provided a much-needed boost for NASCAR. That was a very significant step in the advancement of interest in automobile racing and stock car racing in particular. It was gaining slow but steady progress in the electronic media. Thanks to ABC Sports, they were the ones that were doing the telecast and showing highlights, mixed in with wrist wrestling and log rolling on a Saturday afternoon. But that all this kind of grouped together and it, it helped propel the sport. ABC Motorsports reporter Chris Economaki explains stock car racing to an American audience that was more familiar with open wheel indie style racing than NASCAR. I always felt that every guy with a toolbox had something and every woman was interested in the guy's uh, family life and his children and I touched on all that in my commentary and it was widely accepted. In the 1971 season, six events would be broadcast live start to finish, a first for stock car racing. 
France and ABC chose the second longest operating venue in NASCAR, the Greenville Pickens South Carolina track for the historic broadcast in April of 1971. I was in, in a meeting with all promoters and, and Big Bill, he, he told them all, you people at racetrack, get ready for it. Because one of these days, it is gonna be the largest outdoor sport in the country. 52 cars qualified for the 100-miler at Greenville Pickens, but France allowed only 26 cars to compete, ordering that the race be carried out smoothly. The record crowd, excited by the live television coverage, jammed the wooden grandstands and infield. Producers were anxious that the race would not finish within the two hours allotted by the network. At the driver's meeting, I told him, I says, listen, this thing's got to come off right. Richard Petty spoke up and says, don't worry about it, I'll be leading this thing. I'll get it over in time. He never runs worse in all his life. Jim McKay and Chris Economaki called the race, which was a real snoozer, as the drivers drove like a bunch of old grannies, averaging just 78 miles per hour. Only one caution flag was thrown. Bobby Isaac won by two laps and the race was completed in just one hour and 16 minutes. Bill France had courted, without success in the 1950s, the huge North Carolina-based cigarette manufacturer, R.J. Reynolds. But it was the intrepid Junior Johnson in 1971 who had opened the door for France to claim one of the most lucrative marketing deals in the history of the sport. Johnson went to the cigarette manufacturer looking for less than $100,000 in much needed sponsorship money for his team. And to his astonishment, they offered him 10 times as much. RJR had money to burn and nowhere to spend it as the federal government has banned cigarette advertising on national television. RJR instantly threw millions of dollars into promoting the sport, including the endowment of the NASCAR Points Fund. The Grand National Division was renamed the Winston Cup Series for the 72 season, and NASCAR quietly closed the door on its past. The formal involvement of corporate America forever changed the face of the sport. The mainstay of the Grand National Series the 100 and 150 mile short track races at venues like Greenville Pickens were victims of progress. The race schedule was reduced by half to 30 races a year. In a final farewell to the golden era, Big Bill France, who had managed so effectively, handed the reins over in 1972 to his son Bill Jr., who would lead NASCAR into the future. My father basically, when it comes to stock car racing as we know it today, created a sport. And not many people could say that. We had great drivers back in those days. They were, they, for the type of equipment they had and the knowledge they had, uh, uh, they were as good as, as anybody was at that time. These people lived on the edge. It was the lifestyle that good girls and good boys weren't supposed to do. It was a colorful sport, had a lot of characters, and it had a sport that had a lot of character back then. Got a little bit too cleaned up. I think the folk folklore of this sport is, is fantastic. I mean, there's a lot of people in the PR offices today that just like to forget about all that stuff, forget about their roots. It's history, you can't, you can't forget about it. It's, it's what makes it so, it's what makes this sport so different and appealing to everybody today. You can't wipe out history. No one outside the southern United States cared much about organizing stock car racing until Bill France Sr. 
claimed the sport as his own. With France's iron hand, NASCAR emerged as the leading motorsport sanctioning body in the United States, surpassing the open wheel and sports car classes in popularity. Bill France lived long enough to realize his dream of upstaging AAA, which had so completely rejected his brainchild over the course of his lifetime. Many of the pioneering racers, owners, and mechanics whom Big Bill pulled together after the war just might have been on the wrong side of the law when running moonshine, but it was those same pioneers who helped him build an empire. The NASCAR of today is itself a reflection of these trailblazing, courageous men and women who gave the unique golden era of NASCAR its rightful place in America's history. Thank you.